one of the special things of Hanukkah is the, uh, the no matter where you go and where you drive, especially in, in religious neighborhoods, you see all the Hanukkiyot. And you see every version, every type, everywhere. The people light outside their, their homes, if they have homes, that open up to the street. They light outside their homes, um, which is very common here. Not as common in America. Most people don't light outside their homes. Though, if you ever had an opportunity to drive by my house on uh, on Hanukkah for the past 25 years, I've been lighting outside a glass box. And, uh, and I like the memory is inside, inside the glass box. It's funny here. I was in the past two years, I was lighting outside. This year, I wanted to light outside on my repesset in the wind, which is that we're in, a, we're in an area where there's there were no buildings yet to one of our sides. So the wind, it was like a wind tunnel. So the first night I couldn't light outside, it was just, it was just ironic that in America I've been lighting outside. And then I come here and I, uh, and I wasn't able to, but Last night, Baruch Hashem, I was able to. And it was just as I'm lighting, you know, you're lighting the, the buildings all around me. So I, I must have been lighting at the same time, you know, 50, 60 people. Mm-hmm. Everybody's on their Mepesa with their families and mm-hmm. with their windows and their light. And it's just, mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's a it's a poignant reminder when we say, you know, that, that these Aneris Halalu, these lights are Kodesh, they're holy. Right, they're they're wholly lit by holy people, and it's the thing that's really kept the, the Jewish people going for for all these years. That identity, that sense of sense of belonging to the Jewish nation. It's really it's really an incredible thing. So when you stand at home and you think about your history, that's a, it's great. It's like that's what you're supposed to be doing. But when you stand in, in your home, but your home you see into somebody else's home, who's you know you see into somebody else's home, and all your homes are connected by the same destiny, that's really an incredible thing. Mm-hmm. So it was just a, uh, it was it was a very strong, a very strong feeling for me. Besides the fact, of course, that, you know, this is Sufkaniya land, whatever you have in America, is is nothing in comparison <coughs> to what they have here. Sufkaniyot are not, by the way, the translation of that is not jelly donuts. Sufkaniyot is works of art. That's the translation. They, they, it's unbelievable how they decorate them. It doesn't make them taste any better, but they look they look beautiful. It, and it's incredible. Every store you walk by has has you know all different kinds of creations on top of the uh, on top of the thing. It's really hysterical. Another funny thing is I have across one of my neighbors across from me. I uh, I, I looked outside and I saw Christmas lights, and I said. Holy cow, man! I'm back in La Jolla, but not in this neighborhood. You know, it's like there are no there are no Christians here. Like you know, <laughs> so the Christmas I didn't realize it's not Christmas lights. It's Hanukkah lights. America has it wrong. These are Hanukkah lights. These were lights that they lit to 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 celebrate Hanukkah. It was you know the, the flashing the, you know those flashing bulbs, but but to them they have no idea what what Hanukkah what, what Christmas lights are. To them, this is this is what Hanukkah is. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. You put up lights, you decorate, you do all kinds of stuff. I just found it very cute. I was waiting for some guy in a little red, you know, some Hasidic guy in a little red, <laughs> little red cap with a tassel on the end to come out. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Hanukkah tonight, and um, it's a little bit of a graduate level idea, but but we're going to bring it. Sorry. We're going to try to bring it to, uh, you know, down to earth. I think that when we light the Hanukkah lights, can everybody hear me well enough? Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, the, the When we light the Hanukkah lights, we're always looking. Okay, when we light Hanukkah lights, we're always looking for a, um, for Kavanas. We're looking for what should be in our thoughts. So many times we talk about the concept of, of Jewish history and the fact that we're still around in endurance after all these years. There are people that take Hanukkah to a place that it's not meant to be. They take Hanukkah to a symbol of religious freedom and that it really is, it's the it's a universal holiday. 
because it's something that that speaks to everyone the ability to be able to practice your religion the way you want to. And, and that's not what Hanukkah was at all. Hanukkah wasn't a symbol of religious freedom. Hanukkah was a symbol of religious coercion, that there is only one way to celebrate this, to, 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 to do this religion, and that is through the Torah and through the oral Torah. And there were no choices. So any of the Hellenists, any of the people that were trying to assimilate and to, um, to become part of the um, Syrian Greek culture so then they were, um, they were in essence knocked out, right? In other words, they were disenfranchised. They were chased out of the temple. <clears throat> they were they were disenfranchised from the leadership of the of the Jewish people, and they weren't they weren't part of the picture at all because it was all about you, you the Maccabee was all about um, you, it was all about the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest Matisio. It was it was all about putting Torah back to where it belonged. And that's really ultimately what we're supposed to be looking at and seeing inside of our neros, inside of our candles, inside of our lights. Really, the truth is we're supposed to be lighting oil, not candles. Candles was a thing that came about because it's just easier than lighting oil. But at the end of the day, the miracle happened with oil. The miracle happened that we couldn't find oil. It's not they couldn't find those little red, white, and blue candles, right? So they couldn't find oil. And, and therefore, to reenact the, the miracle and to reenact the entire, the entire um, event and to remember God's intervention and involvement in this event, so then we try to bring it back to the way it was in the temple. And we, try, we do it with, uh, with oil. Nowadays, it's very easy to do with oil. You have the pre-prepared oil, oil vials. All you have to do is break off the top or, or, or pull off a little cap. And you have it. You don't have to. You don't have to sit there with an oil bottle and pour it and put it in a wick. It's all. It's all ready made today. But at the end of the day, that's really. That's really ultimately what we're supposed to be doing. What are we supposed to be thinking when we light the when we light the menorah? Which, by the way, you know anybody who's heard Shurim from me knows that I have a pet peeve about the word Chanukia. I, I don't call my, my my light on uh, on Hanukkah. I don't call it a Chanukia. It's a menorah. The reason that it's a menorah is because that's what was lit in the temple. And that's what we are symbolizing. We're going back to the concept of a menorah. We're going back to that, to that idea. And the Hanukkiah is some brand new invention of a of a, you know of, the, of the, the symbol that we use on Hanukkah. So it becomes a Hanukkiah. But but it separates us from what this is really supposed to be. These lights are not modern lights. These lights are 2,000-year-old lights that connect us back to the base of Mekdash and connect us back to essential times. But it goes even further. <clears throat> because what these lights do is these lights really ultimately connect us to the concept of Torah. And I'll explain. In the temple, there was a chamber. It was a building. In that building, there were really three chambers. There was an antechamber, an outer chamber, which was a long strip. In that, you would walk through that chamber. Then you would get to the main chamber, which was called the Kodesh or the Heichal. And in there, there were three pieces of furniture. You came right up as you walked through the center door. You came to a small altar. It was about a little more than waist size. And it was gold. And the incense was burnt on that altar every single day. To the right of that was a table with 12 shelves. And on that table was the special bread that was baked every Friday, replaced every Shabbat. And then the old bread was taken out on Shabbos and was given to all the Kohanim that were in the temple at the time. That bread symbolized God's material sustenance of the Jewish people. The altar, which is incense, incense goes through the nose, you smell the incense, and that is direct portal into the soul, and the incense represented God's spiritual connection to the Jewish people and spiritual sustenance. Then, if you walked to the left, diagonal, to the end of the room, of that chamber, where there were two curtains. You could only see one, but it was a curtain behind the curtain. And there was the menorah. 
if you walked past the menorah, the two curtains were, one was shorter than the other in the sense that it didn't go to the wall. So there was like a doorway there. And if you walked through that, and then to your right, between the two curtains, was like a walkway to the other end, to the other side of the of the wall, you know, the other side of the of the building. And then there was an opening again, and then you walked into the Kodesh Kadosh in the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies was an ark. Inside of the ark were two cherubs. Inside of the ark were two um, angels sitting over the top of the ark. In the ark were the Ten Commandments, the broken Ten Commandments, a jar of the mun, the original Sefer Torah of Moshe. And that that's what sat inside. That ark represented Torah Shebich Sav, written Torah. Through those two cherubs, those two angels, the divine presence, the Shekhinah, rose, and that was the, the center of the world, where the two worlds became attached to each other. This world, the physical world, and God's world, the spiritual world. And that was the Makam Achibor, the place of attachment of these two worlds. That place, the, um, the, whole, the high priest could only go in once a year on Yom Kippur. Because that world, that was called that room, that chamber of the Kodesh Kadashim. The written Torah that was inside of the Holy of Holies, because that is the Holy of Holies, that's the center of the Jewish people. The written Torah, as I've spoken many times, and I won't elaborate now, but the written Torah is useless without an oral Torah. The oral Torah illuminates the words of the written Torah. The oral Torah becomes the Torah's Chaim, the living Torah of the Jewish people. It's the light of the Jewish people that illuminates and allows us to go on the road of Torah. That's represented by the menorah. When the Hashmonoim came into the temple, the first thing they looked for was a cruise of kosher oil, pure oil, because the Syrian Greeks had impurified all the oil. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. We didn't need pure oil. Again, without going into great detail, there was no halachic reason why we needed pure oil. We weren't doing the service in the temple because it wasn't ready yet. The temple was impure. It was ruined. They, they, had, they had brought in pigs and statues and they were doing all kinds of pagan worship in there. We couldn't, we couldn't use the temple yet. We had to purify. We had to be metahir the temple. The lighting of the menorah as the first act that we did was a statement that Torah is back in the center of the people. That Torah, again, represented by the lights of the menorah, that's why God made a miracle in those lights. There was a miracle in the war, but he needed something to drive the point home that it's not just about winning a war. It's not just about freedom. It's not just about strength, but it's about living with God and living with Torah. And therefore that menorah became the symbol of, of the victory of the Hashmonoim, and that was what they that was what they lit. That's where the miracle happened, and that's what the rabbis instituted in every subsequent year that we celebrate with the lights, so that we remember that it is the Torah that stands at the center of the Jewish people, and without the Torah, we're powerless. Now, what's amazing is, <clears throat> open up any Jewish newspaper you'd like, look at any you know, mildly um, cultural Jewish book and you won't find anything about that. You won't see the word Torah mentioned. You'll see lights and victory and miracles. You'll see military strength and prowess. You will see power. You will see Jewish chutzpah. You will see all of that, but you won't see that it was all about Torah. This is not Wogelinter's version of Hanukkah. This is Hanukkah. Hanukkah is on the 25th day of Kislev. Chanu Chofhei, we rested from the war. And when we were resting from the war, we came into the temple. We lit the menorah. We lit the flag of the Jewish people. And we said that Torah is back to stay. 
Hanukkah. You know, we wonder where Hanukkah guilt comes from. Many people have visceral reactions to gifts because it reminds them of Christmas. All of that is very ancient roots. Not necessarily the gifts, gift wrapped in red and green. That is that has no roots. But the concept of giving gifts, because it was the holiday of Torah, many towns developed a custom that they would look at their Torah institutions on Hanukkah. They would review those institutions. Were those institutions producing what they wanted to produce? They would test the students of these Torah institutions and they would give gifts. They would give monetary gifts, which we call Hanukkah guilt. Hanukkah guilt was really a, a reward for the perpetuation of the study of Torah. It morphed itself as time went on into gifts because of the cultures around us, but it doesn't matter. Never offended me. That's just natural that it would that it would slide into a place like that. But when we used to give Hanukkah, Hanukkah gifts to our children, we gave Hanukkah gifts as a as a reward, as an outcome of the of the Torah that they were learning. There is, when we pray, we say the Alanisim, and in that prayer we say that what were they trying to do to us, the Syrian Greeks? Lahashkicham Torah Secha. They were trying to make us forget the Torah. Ulavira Mechuke Ritzo Necha. And to move us off of the following God's statutes. Now it doesn't say that they were trying to be mevateo, that they were trying to nullify us or cancel out our connection with Torah. They were trying lehashkichon. They were trying shocheach, shikhos, forgetfulness. They were trying to make us forget the Torah. What's the difference between lehashkichon Torah secha, that their goal was to make us forget the Torah and not to be mevatil and not just to cancel and destroy the Torah? And then when you read further, it says that the few were given into the hands of the, the many were given into the hands of the few. The weak, the mighty were given into the hands of the weak. Then one of those is that the, the Hatzalah, the salvation came through the Oske Torah Secha. Oske Torah Secha means la asok. It's the bracha that we make every morning. To be asuk or osek means to be involved in the Torah. But really, who were the people <clears throat> that were victorious? It was the Lone Day Torah. It was the people that learned Torah. It was the people that adhered to the Torah, not merely just Oske Torah Secha, not just merely the people that were involved and engaged. So why didn't it say Lone Day Torah Secha, that you gave the, the, the ones that were um, you know, sinners and, and apostates into the hands of those that learned your Torah? But instead, it says very specifically, Oske Torah Secha. So what I want to understand is, is that what exactly is Lashkicham Torah Secha? What was their goal and objective to make us forget the Torah? And who were these defenders called the Oske Torah Secha? The ones that were engaged and involved in Torah. Look at it. So we have to understand that who were the Yavanim? The Yavanim was a koach. It was a power that was put in the world at the time of creation. When the Torah says in creation, V'choshech al penei tahom, there was darkness on the face of the deep, the rabbis of the Medrash say that what was that darkness that was on the face of the deep, that the world was ensconced, encased in darkness? Zu Malchus Yavan. This is the kingdom of Greece. That they darkened the eyes of the Jewish people. 
that darkness that existed in the beginning of the world was a darkness that the world would be brought back to under the Greek rule, under the culture of Greece. Because what is Choshech? Darkness doesn't negate what's there. A chair doesn't disappear in darkness. Now I know that we play a little game with children and we, we cover our eyes and it's like, we're gone. Peekaboo, I just came back. But at the end of the day, things don't disappear in darkness. They just become obscured. It only causes us not to be able to see them. That was the objective of Greece, of the Syrian Greeks, vis-a-vis -vis God and the Jewish people and their Torah. That what they wanted was, is that they wanted to obscure the light of the Torah. They didn't need to destroy the Torah. The Torah could continue to exist. But that or that light that came from the Torah, that illumination, that spark of holiness, that was what they were trying to destroy. They didn't care about the learning of the wisdom of the Torah. They were intrigued by the wisdom of the Torah. They, what they were trying to destroy is the or hapnimi, was that internal spark and internal light of Torah. And that's something we have to focus on for a moment. When all of you, and I'm going to hopefully be sending this out um, to uh, you know to put it on the, the YouTube channel and um, and also send it out to uh, to the shul, that every person, when you come to a class, you're coming you're coming to be enlightened. You're coming to find out some information to to have it perhaps even touch your touch your soul. One of the things that we sometimes don't realize is that every word of Torah we learn and every word of Torah that we hear, there is an or, Hatayra. There is a light inside of the Torah. And it was, in, the, in that light was God put, the, in, inside of the Torah, God put his light. When he used the letters to create the world, and he used those letters to create the Torah. In every letter is a spark of godliness, is a spark of light. When we daven, we're talking to God. When we learn Torah, God is talking to us. And he's not merely talking to us through his words, but that inside of those words, he has embedded a part of himself, a part of his soul, and he is putting that soul inside inside of us he's putting that holiness that spark that light inside of us when we pursue god in the torah when we at the beginning of a shear think to ourselves i have an opportunity in the next half hour 45 minutes to touch god when i sit down to read the weekly parsha and i look at the weekly parsha and i say that I'm looking for God and I want to connect to God. I just don't want the information of what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. I don't want you to want to know just the story of tossing Joseph into a pit, but I want to understand what that means because I want to connect and to find God there. So then that's when we can connect to that aura Torah, to that light of the Torah. When we have that single-minded pursuit for the only thing in the world that independently exists, and that's God and his Torah, because everything else in this world is dependent existence, but that is independent existence. So then we have the opportunity to be able to see and to experience the light in everything. The more desire I have to connect to God through his Torah, the more I will connect to God through his Torah, the more I will feel that light and the more I will feel that or the more I will feel that Kesher, that, that, that tie, that connection to him. That kind of study of Torah, the kind of study of Torah that's not about info, the kind of study of Torah that's not about just inspiration, but the kind of study of Torah that's about 
seeking God, that kind of Torah is called Torah Rishma. That's studying Torah for the sake of studying Torah. And that's the most desired form of Torah from God. And even though we are allowed to learn Shalom Lishma, we're allowed to learn Torah, not necessarily for that reason, for side reasons. I enjoy it. It's spiritual. It makes me feel good. It gives me, it gives me great information. It gives me lots of stuff to think about and to talk about. All that's great. But that's only great when ultimately it turns into seeking God. Because ultimately, that's what Torah is. Ultimately, Torah is that connection, that deep connection to God. That's the Torah that brings a person to Kirvas Elohim, to the closeness with the master of the universe. Because the Torah has the koach, has the power to be able to attach us to God and to help us feel a connection to him. And even though while we learn, we don't necessarily think that you're looking at me, you're following me, you're listening, you're, if you're studying a text, you're involved in the text, <clears throat> you're engaged in working out all the nuances of the text. The last thing you're thinking about is, oh, I feel so holy and so connected to God, right? Unless, you know, you're a, you're a hippie from the 60s, you ain't thinking about that. That's not the way you're learning. That's not with what's going through your mind as you're learning. But it doesn't matter. Because even though we don't necessarily feel that connection while we're learning, when our approach is that I am deepening my relationship with the master of the universe, with the Rebbeinu Shalom, so then by definition what I'm doing is, is that I am, I am drawing closer to him. And that's called Torah Lishma, Torah for the purest sake, and that the power is unestimable. When that happens... There is a shefa, there is a great influence that descends on a person which brings with it the feelings of love and fear and connection with Hashem Yisbarach, with God. And that's how we know that our learning was Ayla Luratzin. Because if when we walk away from our learning, we feel that sense of connection, you can call it inspiration. You can call it you know, there was so much to think about. You can give it any kind of epitaph and name, but ultimately it makes you feel connected to the creator and to the master of the universe. Then you know that that, was, that that Torah was accepted by God because it's doing its magic. It's doing what it's meant to do. Don't think for one moment that all you're doing when you're learning is connecting your soul to the light of Torah, but you're bringing that light of Torah into the world itself. Every time a person studies Torah, the world is elevated, and the world becomes closer to God, and the light of God is revealed inside of the world. That is the exact opposite of what the Yavanim represented and what they wanted to accomplish. What they wanted to accomplish was Torah They wanted us to forget the Torah. They didn't want us to be mevatel. They didn't want to nullify it and to uproot it necessarily. That wasn't their objective. What their objective was to darken the light. And when you darken the light, when you take out the godliness, when you make Torah about culture, when you make Torah about knowledge, when you make Torah about information, when you make it academic, you suck the light out of it. And when you suck the light out of it, it does no, no everlasting power. It has no kiyum. It can't exist. It can't maintain itself. And ultimately, what they wanted was to extinguish this kirvas elokim, this closeness that Torah caused with God. That's what lahashkicham Torah secha means. To make us forget, to not to be to make it that we couldn't see our, that we couldn't see God, and we couldn't see 
the whole the, the we couldn't see the whole vision, the whole the whole light that was coming through the words of Torah. How do you darken the eyes of a Jew? How do you get somebody to learn without feeling the light? That's what Chachma Yivanis is called. Chachma Yivanis means Greek wisdom. The Talmud mentions a few times that there were people that excelled in Greek wisdom. What was Greek wisdom? Greek wisdom was the darkness that we spoke about at the very beginning of creation. When God is obscured, when godliness is obscured, that wisdom is pure darkness. There, when, when there appears to be other goodnesses in the world, when you look at it and say, it's not just God, but there's so many other amazing things in this world. When there is, when there is, there is a, um, there are other, there are other op options and opportunities besides just God and Torah that are equally as good. God and Torah are good, but the other options are also good. That's Lashkicham Torah Secha. That's darkening our eyes in Torah. That's why it says that it wasn't just the long day Torah, the people that learned Torah that were able to, to be victorious over the Syrian Greeks. It was the Oske Torah Secha. It was the people that it was total involvement of their lives. They were Osuk Torah. They were totally involved in Torah. There was no side points. There were no. There was nothing else. There was no competition for their time and for their for their mind. There was no competition for their loyalty. There was no competition for their focus. It was only about God, spirituality, and Torah. <clears throat> That's why who Dafka were the ones that were able to be victorious, not the learners of Torah, because they could have been learning empty. It was those that were oske the Torah, those that were completely involved in Torah. In the most sur, when we say that Hanukkah was established as a holiday, who did we say established the holiday? It doesn't say the rabbis. It says the B'nai Bina. B'nai Bina, Yemei Shmona, Kavu Shirunanim. That it's the people of understanding that were able to set up this holiday. What do you mean the people of understanding? It was the people who learned Torah. No, no. It wasn't the learners of Torah. It was those that understood the depth and were able to see the light of Torah, were able to recognize the godliness in Torah. And that's the Ner Hanukkah. As you light those lights, what we have to be looking at is we have to be looking at God. It's not just about Jewish strength that has endured for 2,000 years, that has helped us endure 2,000 years of exile, it is the connection to God. Because without that connection to God, all the power and all the resolve and all the, all the kayach would be useless. Ultimately, it's because we feel that connection to the Ein Od Milvado, to the one whom there is nothing beside him, that's why we're still here after 2,000 years. When I stand on my Mirpeset and I look and I watch all those people the, when my, in, my, in my eyesight, so I've got, I said 60, maybe 100, 100 people that I'm seeing in my eyesight, but I'm filled with this sense that it's that lighting it's that or, it's that internal light of Torah that has propped us up, kept us illuminated, and kept us as a people. And that's why we're still here. It's not the latke eaters, and it's not the dreidel spinners. It's the ones who see in all of that godliness, who sit down to a shear and are connecting themselves to God, who open up a sitter and are dominating God's dominating who are living a Shabbos, who are living a holiday, and they're living God's holiday. It's when we put God in the center, that's when we become illuminated. And when we're illuminated, we are in, we cannot be defeated. 
We are undefeatable when we have that light of God inside of us. Indestructible. That's, to me, one of the very important messages of Hanukkah. And it's some of the stuff that I feel when I look at my lighting and I look at other people's lighting also. It's my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Rabbi. It's it's a it's it's a beautiful thing. I don't know how long it took, but however long it took, it, you know, it was at forty minutes. Forty minutes we're sitting inside of the most illuminated, the most lit piece of the world, because we're sitting inside of the light of Torah, and it's just the yeah. you can you can feel it and see it when you're cognizant of it. Okay, like five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you feel better soon, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Have a good week.